Hello and welcome to Tel Megiddo. This is one of the largest and most important archaeological sites in all of Israel. It's a site that has an extent of about 125 acres and this site has been called one of the most battled over sites on the planet. It has about 26 different occupational layers and I'm coming to you now from the Canaanite four-chambered gate to the city. This, this entrance to the city, you can see the various chambers behind me. Now the Bible mentions Megiddo approximately a dozen times throughout the Hebrew Bible and it's also one of the rare Old Testament sites mentioned in the New Testament. It's referenced as Armageddon in the book of Revelation. Now Armageddon is a Greek version of the Hebrew name Har Megiddo, meaning Mount of Megiddo. Now at this time period of, of the Canaanites, this location within which I'm standing, we read that Joshua and the Israelites came and killed the king of Megiddo again, as with Gezer, in a separate battle, but the Canaanites remained in the land. And we read about this in Judges 1 and verse 27. This gives us the lay of the land at this time period in Israel's history. We read of this territory of Megiddo within the land assigned to Manasseh, quote, And Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Bethshan and its towns, nor of Tanakh and its towns, nor the inhabitants of Dor and its towns, nor the inhabitants of Iblim and its towns, nor the inhabitants of Megiddo and its towns, but the Canaanites were resolved to dwell in the land. So as we covered with Gezer, there was a similar situation, it appears, where if we look at the Amana letters and associate the Habiru, which they talk about conquering the land, uh, there, there seems to be a similar situation here at Megiddo, that there was some internal strife within the city and that there was a revolt against the king and the Canaanites perhaps, because of revolting against a king who perhaps was against the Habiru leader, they were allowed to remain in the land. But of course, this was against what God had planned and God's intention for the Canaanites of the area to be driven out. I'm standing now within the Israelite gate to Tel Megiddo. It's a little bit further in from the outer Middle Bronze period Canaanite city gate. Now this fascinating gate structure is what is known as an Israelite gate or six chambered gate or Solomonic gate. Now this site was excavated in the 1960s by Professor Yigal Yadin and he noticed this layout, this peculiar six chambered layout to this gatehouse and he noticed it was much the same as what he excavated in Tel Gezer and in Tel Chatzor. And this is quite interesting when we compare it to the biblical account because the Bible says that Solomon built these three specific cities and it actually also adds in Jerusalem and more recently a very similar gatehouse has been discovered by Dr. Elat Mazar in Jerusalem. Now we read of this in 1 Kings 9 verse 15, quote, And this is the account of the levy which King Solomon raised to build the house of the eternal and his own house and Milo and the wall of Jerusalem and Chatzor and Megiddo and Gezer. And what do we find at all these four sites? Usually they're talked about as three sites, but as I just mentioned, we can add in Jerusalem now. We find these chambered gatehouses, not only that match each other in style, but also dimension. Various architects have come through over the decades and measured these gatehouses and compared them to one another. And they line up just incredibly well, even to the nearest centimeters in some aspects, comparing the various chamber sizes, the width of the walkways, the, the length and depth of these gatehouses. It's an incredible match. And not only that, the pottery, the remains at these gatehouses allow them to be dated to the 10th century BCE, which is the very time that King Solomon was on the scene. Now what this points to is a strong centralized authority based in the land that can exert this sort of a blueprint over all of these cities throughout the land of Israel from right up north in Chatzor, further on south to here in Megiddo, and then right down south to Gezer and Jerusalem. So evidently there was some kind of administration that exerted this control over this 
wide area, and that's what we see with these gatehouses. Now, another very interesting thing about them are these wooden boards that separate the courses of stones. Now, this fits with another biblical account, which talks about Solomon, together with the help of King Hiram of Tyre, building in this same method. Now, it doesn't talk about them building gatehouses in this method. It talks about them working on the temple of Jerusalem in this method. We see precedent for it, a series of rows of stones built on top of one another, then separated by this wooden section, and then another series of stones built over the top. All right, we're going to go further into the city now and check out some of the other areas of this incredible site. I'm coming to you now from a part of the city known as the Northern Stables on the upper part of the city. Now, Tel Megiddo was one of the chief chariot cities of Israel, and it's believed in the upper part of the city that about 150 horses could be kept here in the city. And obviously the Bible talks in many places about King Solomon owning and dealing in horses. And we also see that that's the case a century forward in Israel's history. We see that during the time period of Ahab especially. Now this isn't only from the biblical account that we read of this, but from the Assyrian accounts. There is a victory stealer called the Kirk Monolith, which is found in the British Museum. And it talks about a battle that King Shalmaneser III fought against King Ahab during the latter part of Ahab's reign. Now on this stealer, it talks about Ahab fielding 2,000 chariots for a battle. Now normally in minimalist circles, the Israelite kingdom is diminished or the biblical account is described as going over the top in its descriptions of Israel's power. But here in this victory stealer, we read about 2,000 chariots, far more than any of the other forces that were also joined to the battle. So many have taken this Kirk monolith stealer to be an over-exaggeration, shall we say. But if we take it at face value and the biblical account at face value, we see that ancient Israel, particularly here in the Northern Kingdom, was a powerful force that, that fielded thousands of chariots, the Bible describes thousands and thousands of horsemen, uh, thousands of chariots, and we read about that in Assyrian accounts as well. So why should we doubt both angles of this story? Now these stables are believed to date to the same time period, in fact, as King Ahab, the 9th century BCE. So that fits well with the biblical account, it fits well with the Assyrian accounts of the type of military force the type of cavalry that was being used by the Israelites. And actually, horses and chariots are mentioned quite a lot in the biblical account. Now, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 17, it warns the kings not to accumulate vast quantities of horses to themselves because it will lead to the king trusting more in their forces rather than in God. But we see this happening during the reign of King Solomon and King Ahab, first and second kings, that this was a wicked king likewise throughout much, much of his reign. And so we see during the reigns of these kings, them accumulating horses, cavalry, chariots to themselves. And we find evidence of just that here at Tel Megiddo, one of the chief chariot cities of Israel during the 9th century BCE. Behind me are the very foundational remains of a palatial structure that Yigal Yadin believed was the palace at the site of King Solomon. Now in that respect it may be similar to the palace so-called found in Tel Gezer near the gatehouse that dates to the 10th century BCE. Now there's some debate, as with many things in archaeology, about the dating of this palatial compound, whether it dates to the 10th century, to the time of King Solomon, or perhaps a century later to the time of King Ahab. But what we see here are just the very foundational remains of a grand and massive structure. And then just behind that are the colonnaded uh, stables that we just discussed a moment earlier. What you can see below me in the center of Tel Megiddo is an immense ritual compound dating from primarily the Canaanite time periods, from the early bronze period all the way up until the Iron I period. You'll notice quite prominently in the center is a large 
round sacrificial altar and throughout this area thousands of sacrificial animal bones were discovered. Before me here you see the remains of a massive grain silo that was discovered here at Tel Megiddo. Now this dates to the 8th century BCE or the time of the, the reign of King Jeroboam II. Jeroboam II was one of the powerful kings that ruled the northern kingdom of Israel during the early to mid 8th century BCE. And something fascinating about this king discovered at this site was a seal impression. Now, not within the silo, but elsewhere on the site was a seal impression that says, Leshima Eved Yerovam, belonging to Shema, the servant of Jeroboam. We have this biblical record of King Jeroboam II and with the seal discovered in the early 1900s here at Tel Megiddo, we have archeological evidence for this king as well. And as I said, you can see this grain silo, which was built during this time period. And you'll note the steps that wind down descending into the silo. I'm standing now on the southern end of the city within a smaller gateway that leads into this palace area behind me. Now, this is one of the less restored areas of the site obviously, so it's harder to tell what is behind me, but this is a series of rooms within a large uh, Ashler courtyard area, and this is believed to be a palace area dating to, again, there's some debate about it, perhaps the time of King Solomon in the 10th century BCE, or again, perhaps a century later, dating to the time of King Ahab in the 9th century. I'm standing now within the southern stables of Tel Megiddo. You can see to my left this rather famished looking horse depicted. There's another one on the other end and several of these horses and chariots depicted around the site. But what you see here are two rows where horses would be kept separated by these pillars, these columns. And in between them you have these troughs which would have been used to feed and water the horses. In similar form to the northern stables, this one is a bit more well-preserved and reconstructed and we see that like the northern stables, this would have been a twin row area for keeping the city's many horses. I'm now standing at the entrance to a water tunnel system that was carved either during the 10th century or 9th century BCE, either the time of King Solomon or King Ahab. Now there is a spring located near Tel Megiddo, but just outside and down from the fortifications. Now naturally, that is going to be risky during a siege environment. Uh, there's the potential of water being cut off to the city and being used to refresh the troops of the enemy. So naturally, the city, in laying out the defensive work, they wanted to block off this, the outer entrance to the spring, just outside and down from the tell, and instead carve this immense tunnel down underground to get to the spring. So we're going to go down and take a look at that. Here at the access point to the spring, we are now down and outside the city fortifications, and we can actually leave the city through this original access point to the spring. Thank you very much for joining us on this program. We hope you've enjoyed our brief tour of Tel Megiddo. Stay tuned for the next one. Mm -hmm.